All right, so let's uh, let's get started. So couple housekeeping items. So my name is Mark Lamonic. I look after our individual investor team here in Australia. Um, today, we're going to talk about small and micro cap shares, which hopefully should be interesting. Also, anyone who's interested tonight, we're talking about how much money you need in retirement. So we are going to talk about all stages of life when we, uh, when we look at that, see if you're on track for retirement. So sign up for that. If you need the link or the sign up, you can just send me an email at mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. All right, anything today is general advice. I don't know anything about you, so I can't offer personal advice. Also, if you're in New Zealand, you can go onto our website, morningstar.com.au, and check out our FAP if you would like. And the New Zealand regulatory authorities encourage you to um, go speak to a financial advisor if you want personal advice. All right, so as I said, we're gonna talk about small and micro cap investing today. So a new topic for us. So I am in the room with Shani and Will, which is nice because it's been a very long time since I've had anyone in here with me. But let's get into the presentation. So for anyone who's listened to the podcast, we recently hit a milestone on the podcast and have planned, I planned a surprise event. So these are pictures from the last milestone we hit. So this is back before lockdown, obviously, which involved bowling and Korean barbecue. So for people who have not seen Will, I think Will has only appeared on one of these episodes, our end of year episode last year. So you can guess which one is Will in the pictures. And uh, and of course, the other person is Shawnee. So if anyone can guess what that event is, I'll give you a free ticket to the conference. So yeah, send through any guesses that you have. So also Will and Shawnee don't know what the event is. So I think that this is a trick so they can find out the surprise, but <laughs> we'll see. All right, so let's talk about investing in small and micro cap shares. So first of all, we'll just start with a little bit of a definition. So what are small and micro cap shares? So of course, when we talk about market capitalization, we are talking about the size of a company and we measure size and how much a company is worth. So that is the number of shares outstanding times the price. So as prices change, the sizes of companies change. If more shares are issued or if more shares are bought back, the size of the company changes. And the reason we define companies in that way and not versus something, or I guess, less arbitrary, like the amount of employees a company has or the amount of revenue it earns. The reason we do this is, of course, because when we're looking at the share market, we are buying pieces of companies. If we would buy the whole company, that would be the size of the company. That would be the price or the market capitalization. So small cap shares are companies with market capitalization between $300 million um, and $2 billion. Micro cap shares have a market capitalization below $300 million. So one thing to note is these are kind of universal definitions, right? Um, so, you know, there's no... There's no Australian dollar, US dollar um, amount that we're looking at there. That's just our general rule. Now, of course, different markets are different sizes. So I want to use a little bit of an example. So I looked at the ASX 200. And so those are the 200 largest shares in Australia. And we can see that the smallest company in the ASX 200, which a lot of people would classify sort of large cap stocks in Australia, is just above that threshold. And I checked this last week when I mistakenly thought that I was doing this webinar last Thursday, um, which happens to me often, which is probably a sign of senility. But anyway, a little over $2 billion, so just above that threshold. So if we just go out of the ASX 200, we're really dipping into that small cap realm. Then if we go and we look at the S&P 500, so in the US, the 500th largest shares, you'll see the 500th, once again, last week, biggest company was Fox Corporation that had a market cap of 21 billion. So you can see well beyond, um, you know, well beyond that threshold to get into small caps. All right, which slide do you think people like better? The first one or the second one? The pictures or the definition? No comment. All right. So let's uh, let's look at some of the implications um, of investing in small and micro cap shares. So, of course, when we are looking at smaller companies, we need to, of course, as investors, we need to think like business owners. We need to think about what the implication is of those different businesses. All right. We have one vote for pictures. There we go. <laughs> Maybe I should just shut up and go back to that slide. And uh, that was 
you know, back when I could get a haircut. Um, so let's think about the business implications of investing in smaller companies. So small and micro cap companies have more business risk, but also more potential for growth. So let's talk that through. When we look at business risk, what through, <laughs> when we, uh, when we think about business risk, what we're looking at is the risk to future cash flows. So this is a concept that we've explained before. So anytime you are investing in a share, you are, of course, investing for the future cash flows that the company that you will now own generates. So it's the risk to those cash flows. So let's take a couple different scenarios. And we, we have talked about this before, and I always used a... I always use a liquor example, maybe just because I like liquor, but, um, but also because I think intuitively people can understand that. So if I was to start a little boutique gin distillery, for example, that just made gin and just made it in New South Wales, um, a lot of people have done that. That could be a great business. If I'm Diageo, a global liquor giant that sells in almost every country, um, that has a very diversified range of products. So not just gin, but tequila and vodka and whiskey and rum. It's like I'm talking about all my friends. Um, very diversified product, lots of different price points. If we think about business risk, who has the biggest business risk? Well, it's my gin distillery. Because number one, geographically, I'm just in one place. Also, I have one product line. So you can think of all the things that would impact me really adversely, those are higher. Also, I don't have access to the same funding. I don't have as many employees. Everything that we would think about from a business risk standpoint, I would have more risk. But I also have a lot more opportunity because I, on a year-to-year -year basis, conceivably for a while, I could continue to double my sales in gin. Right, So more people hear of me, more people buy the gin. I could expand to Victoria. All sorts of different things that I can do. Diageo can't grow as fast. So when we think about investing in small and micro cap stocks, we have to remember that. Um, so you know, there are, of course, yeah, all sorts of issues. Every issue you can think about running a small business, but also a lot more potential. And when these issues come out, is generally during times of economic stress. Because once again, Diageo has a lot of assets. They have a lot of cash. They have access to a lot of funding. So if there are times of economic stress, it's more likely that they are going to be able to survive than a tiny company. So um, as it says on here, yeah, precarious balance sheets. So potentially next ca less cash or investing everything they can, a small company and trying to grow. And then they don't have that operational diversification. However, we want to describe that, whether it's geographic product lines, et cetera. So what are the investment implications? So once again, we always want to start with thinking about the business we're buying, because that's what we're buying as shareholders. And let's think about the investment implications. OK, so we should expect more volatility. So we should expect the prices of small and micro cap stocks to bounce around more. So that's number one. The other thing that we need to think about is there's less liquidity in the market. And I'll explain what this means in a second. Um, and that can contribute to these extreme price movements. So it's the same point that you can see very extreme price movements. Now, liquidity is the amount of basically buyers and sellers um, for any share. So less liquidity means that if you think about how a share price moves, it's basically a share price is searching for um, searching for a price. It's searching for buyers and sellers, right? So if there's a bunch of people selling a share and there's no buyers, it's going to keep falling in price until it finds a buyer, right? So if there's a lot of liquidity, a lot of people buying and selling shares, it's gonna minimize those price movements, but you could have very large price movements with small and micro cap shares and anything else where there's less liquidity. That's why we like liquidity. And a lot of what a share market is, well, almost all, all of what a share market is, is about providing liquidity. Um, but there's more if we're at large cap stocks. Um, so the implication, of course, of the greater business risk and the greater risk during times of trouble is that if we talk about cyclicality, how these, these shares generally perform, they tend to do a lot worse than large companies during economic stress, right? So that, like anytime there's economic stress, there's a flight to quality, 
right? So people are going to more quality companies during economic stress, uh, people potentially currencies, the same thing, right? That people are, I don't know who they are. Um, people are moving to potentially safe haven currencies during economic stress. So we can think about the same thing in the share market. So when times are bad, generally small and micro caps do worse, but they tend to do better during market recoveries. And so there's a lot of people, of course, that play a little bit of this cyclicality timing game where they are trying to rotate into assets like small cap shares as markets recover because they tend to do better. This last point is really important. We'll talk about that later. It's a less efficient part of the market. So market efficiency is, is kind of this nebulous concept, but it is how much do prices represent values, right? So there can be differences between the value of a company and the price that it's trading for. The more efficient a market is, the closer those are together, the less efficient, the bigger gaps on either side can open up. So if we're looking at active versus passive, so active managers that are out selecting shares and passive managers that are just following an index, generally active managers do better in less efficient parts of the market. So that can be small and micro cap shares, that can be bonds, that can be emerging markets, um, that can be, as we talked about, on Tuesday, um, that can be real estate, uh, listed real estate. So this is an opportunity for active managers to do well. Um, and you know, if you think about it intuitively, there are a lot of people who cannot invest in small and people, I mean, large institutional investors that can't invest in these parts of the market, right? If you're investing a certain amount of money, you literally can't invest in these parts of the market because statistically wouldn't make any sense, right? You know, if I'm going and trying to find companies, if I'm running $50 billion and I'm going to find companies that are trading for less than $200 million, for me to have that play any role in my portfolio, I'd have to buy the whole company. Um, so a lot of managers don't play in that space, meaning there's a lot less attention paid by analysts and institutional investors. So it is an opportunity for active managers. And you know, I will say there's a lot more risk, but an opportunity for individual investors as well. So if you think about edge, um, which we'll get into in a little bit, but if you think about what your edge is, whether that's an analytical edge, that you think you can analyze the numbers better, or even an informational edge, that you think that you have data that not that people don't have access to, but that people don't pay attention to, that's potentially somewhere you would want to play. John says, I like red wine too. Yeah. Um, I agree. I'm going to have some later. All right. So let's talk about these two young and spry looking guys, Fama and French. So they are shockingly professors at the University of Chicago. And they did a very famous study that is called the three factor model. They're a study about the three factors that influence returns. So they took a look at three different inputs of return, or three different variables, and looked at how returns tracked it across them. So they looked at size of firms, which we're talking about right now, obviously. They looked at book to market values. So that is a proxy for value investing. So book value is Basically, it's assets minus liabilities, a little more complicated than that. But basically, if you take all the assets the company has and take out all the debt, you're left with book value. Then they looked at excess returns. So excess returns is the factor they're trying to, quote unquote, solve for in this, uh, in this um, study. So basically, what this means is they're looking from tiny firms to giant firms. They're looking for growth stocks and value stocks, and they're trying to identify um, what has outperformed. And what they came up with is they, of course, came up with um, the fact that uh, small cap value outperformed. Um, so this is another reason that people are very interested in small cap shares. Now, we're going to get into some return slides in a second. And I want to be very clear that this was a historic look and this has not happened, and there could be a lot of reasons for this, which we'll talk about, but this has not happened since the GFC. So basically, 
large cap growth shares have outperformed. Now, that could continue forever. I have no idea, obviously. I don't know the future. Um, but yeah, that is, uh, that's their study. And so that's why a lot of people, um, yeah, that's why a lot of people have, of course, been looking at these small cap shares. All right, so let's look at long-term performance. All right, so there's an index in the U.S., it's not talked about a lot, called the Wilshire 5000. So it represents all publicly traded shares in the U.S. And interestingly enough, there are not 5,000 shares in the Wilshire 5000 because, yeah, there's less publicly traded companies. But they took a look at a 30-year performance, or I took a look at a 30-year performance. I made this slide. I don't know who they are. Um, so I looked at 30-year performance. And you can see that microcap outperformed everything else. Mid-cap did beat small cap. But all of them outperformed large cap shares. And once again, this is looking at a very long time frame. We'll look at a shorter time frame soon. But yeah, there was, uh, yeah, there was um, outperformance. Now, if we look at Australia, and we go back and we look at, I mean, the data that I had was a little bit, a little bit dated. But if you go back and you look at 1990 to 1998, small cap indexes have underperformed the large cap index by around 2.8% a year, which is a ton. So that is a ton. Now, there's all sorts of speculation about why this may be. I was looking at a First Links article, which I thought was pretty interesting. And you know, the speculation in there is that basically Australia does not have a venture capital industry. Um, so it doesn't have a mature venture capital industry. And because of that, a lot of firms were listing before they should have. And a lot of these firms were mining firms, which are even more volatile than other small firms, because you take all of those other risks associated, then you look at mining, you've got two things. Number one, you can't control the price that you're selling anything at, right? You're a price taker. Um, and it generally requires very large capital expenditures initially um, to find whatever you're digging out of the ground. Um, and that, of course, can make the company even more precarious. Um, so, and what this means with, with not a mature venture capital. So venture capital, of course, is what invests is invests in private businesses. So what they're saying here, the implicate what they're saying, the reason for this is, is because you don't have this venture capital layer that takes and sort of weeds out terrible businesses and invests in them with the goal of taking them public. Because you don't have that layer, they're just listing. So there's listing on the exchanges, and you're getting a bunch of very unprofitable, poor companies um, that wouldn't list in a country like the U.S., where you have a very mature venture capital um, venture capital model to uh, to sort of bring companies public. You know, something to think about. All right, so here's a, here's a look since 2010 of Aussie small cap versus large cap. So I'm looking at two things here. We're looking at the S&P ASX Small Ordinaries Accumulation Index. Um, and then we're looking at the, um, and so basically that's all the shares of companies that are in the ASX 300, but not the 100. So basically we're looking at 200 to 300 versus large cap. So you can see right there that we've had pretty significant um, outperformance by, by large cap shares. So, all right. So that IOZ, by the way, is this 136. This is that large cap. And these are ETFs, of course, that, uh, that I'm looking at. All right. The other thing, of course, that you get with small cap shares is you get volatility. Now, in Australia, what you're getting investing in local small cap shares is you're getting volatility, a lot more risk, and less return, which hopefully we all know as investors, is a really bad thing. So you're getting all this extreme volatility and you're not getting as much return. So if we look at these two, so once again, this is the IOZ over there. You guys proud of me for saying Z? They look disinterested. Um, if we have the IOZ over here, and then this is the small cap. So what we're gonna look at from a volatility standpoint is we're gonna look at standard deviation. 
Now, the reason we're going to look at standard deviation is because beta can be misleading if you are not comparing. So generally what we do with beta is we would compare an individual share to an index. In this case, these two are looking at different indexes. Um, so of course their beta is going to be one because these are index tracking ETFs looking at specific indexes. But you could do, if you wanted to calculate it yourself, you could do look at the beta off of a standard index to see the, the differences in volatility. But we're going to look at standard deviation. So standard deviation measures, um, once again, how far prices bounce around um, and sort of expected deviations based on a normal distribution um, from zero. So you can see here, 17.56, the lower the better. Right. So if we think about if we think about how standard deviation works, not to get all statistics, Shawnee likes this because she's taking statistics. Um, but, you know, a normal distribution means that 66 percent of the time that a return will be within one standard deviation. So you can see 66 percent of the time the return will be plus or minus twenty one and a half percent for the large cap. It's seventeen and a half percent. I don't know why all these people are in here. Um, so you can see that it's a lot more volatile if we look at small caps. So yeah, sort of the message is small caps in Australia have not at least historically offered a good risk and return trade-off for investors. All right, let's go over to the US. So I looked at those 30-year returns earlier, looking at the Wilshire um, index, but now we're going to look at um, two different ETFs. So we are going to look at um, just SPY is the S&P 500. So that's large cap. This is small cap. So this is where we're looking at that period. Um, well, we went back a decade, but as I said, since the GFC, large cap growth has outperformed and you can see it there, right? So very, very close, but has outperformed. And the S&P 500, of course, is not just growth. If we put a growth index on here, it'd be up more. Um, so this sort of famine French three-factor model has not worked out um, since the GFC, but once again, Anything can happen in the future. And once again, if we go and we look at, these are two US ETFs, so a small cap and a large cap. If we look at standard deviation, you can see the difference here. Um, so, you know, it's closer. So if we were looking at sort of risk and reward of US small caps versus US large caps, US looks a little better, but you're still getting outperformance by large cap with less volatility, which is what we want as investors. And then the last slide, we're really, geez, we're moving through this quickly. Um, so the last slide, we want to look at how do you actually access small and micro cap shares? So I went and I looked at all of the different funds and ETFs that we um, rate bronze, silver, gold here at Morningstar, so our highest ratings. Looked at if they were active or passive and then looked at their fund or ETF. So we have one fund which gets a gold rating, this Vanguard Miski International small cap ETF. So this is basically everything except for Australia. So this is international investing, as you can see, global. And then once we start moving into the fund space, we start seeing a lot of active offerings, right? So we've got Vanguard International small companies. So basically this is the same, these are the same basically. Vanguard ETF and these two funds. The difference being the second fund, the one that says HDG on it, just means it's hedged. So they're removing currency risk. But then you can see if we look at all these funds from dimensional, et cetera, um, we are looking at global for dimensional and then some Aussie um, small cap funds. These are all actively managed, but still receive a medalist rating for us. So thank you guys for joining. Um, if anyone has any guesses of where the team event is for Investing Compass for our latest milestone, don't tell these two, but you can guess to me. But anyway, thank you guys for joining.
Any advice in this video is general advice prepared by Morningstar without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest.